Okay, good evening, everyone. My name's Maggie, and I'm a PhD student in HTC, and together with Diane, my colleague and co-organizer, we have the pleasure of welcoming you, both virtually and in person, as we celebrate the 2022 History, Theory, and Criticism Lecture Forum as part of the Department of Architecture's Spring Series. I'd like to begin first with a land acknowledgement statement. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. And now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker, Hentai Yap. Hentai Yap is currently Associate Professor of Performance Studies in the Department of Theater and Dance at UC San Diego. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley and has previously taught at New York University, Pomona College, and San Francisco State University. He's the author of Minor China, Method, Materialisms, and the Aesthetic, published by Duke University Press in 2021, and the co-editor with C. Riley Snorton of Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value, published by MIT Press in 2020. And his research broadly engages the theoretical and methodological implications of queer, feminist, disability, and critical race studies for questions regarding the state and the transnational. And before I hand it over to Hentai, just a logistical note for the Q&A portion of this event. So if you're watching online, please feel free to post questions through our live webcast portal or via Facebook Live. And for our in-person audience members, please use the microphone stand at the back of the room um, to ask questions once prompted to do so for the Q&A. Um, and we'll answer as many of the online and in-person questions as possible. And now please join me in welcoming Hentai Yap for his talk titled The Ubiquity of Asia. So thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I feel quite risque not wearing a mask. Um, so this will be, this feels so dangerous. Um, so thank you so much to the Department of Architecture and the History, Theory, and Criticism program for the invitation to be part of this lecture series. I also want to thank Diane and Maggie, Aidan, um, Kathleen, and many others for their time and work in organizing this event. Um, it's a real honor to be here with you all today. Um, so this is a sort of new piece of writing. Um, I, uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020, I was working on the proofs of the book that came out a year later. And then my friends were asking me, um, you know, what are you working on next? Next, And I would always jokingly say, like, I'm not gonna think for about two more years. Um, so I feel like the two years has now hit. And so this is my attempt at thinking again. Um, so this is sort of newer writing that I'm um, excited to share with you all today. Uh, China supplies 129,000 tons of fireworks to the United States, which accounts for 95% of the market. The value of this market in 2019 was over $270 billion. In other words, one nation in Asia supplies the vast majority of the objects used to celebrate mass events, notably the celebration of US independence. This single nation, as such, amasses hundreds of billions of dollars through a small everyday item. Other spaces uh, beyond the US similarly rely on Chinese exports to the global supply chain for fireworks amongst, as we know, many other goods. Further, beyond China, the fireworks industry is primarily controlled by a single man. There is two shipping companies, Shanghai Huayang and First Trans International. Ding Yangzong controls 70% of the trade. Based out of southeastern China, Ding was, ex uh, was exporting an estimated 72 shipping containers into the US every day. This is not an anomalous story about fireworks. It is rather an emblematic parable for capital, with China controlling the circulation of most goods across the world. Considering that the very material used for spectacles, particularly for the celebration of nation states, is applied by Chinese capital and logistics, uh, what might this tell, about, tell us about racial capital today? Mr. Ding's deep involvement in the, fire, in the fireworks industry is illustrative of China's and more broadly Asia's relationship to capital. 
Beyond the fireworks industry, China and Asia are central to the global supply chain. Further, Asia saturates popular culture, as Korean pop and dramas and Japanese anime are now not viewed as exotic imports, but rather as part of culture at large. All this to say, it feels like Asia is everywhere. Asia is ubiquitous. In the American cycle of capital accumulation under Giovanni Arrigo's schema, the dominance and overrepresentation of the United States uh, was marked through notions like Disneyfication and the ascendancy of whiteness, to quote Rach Howe, and Disneyfication from Baudrillard. As a result, minoritarian and non-Western groups and spaces came to be measured against the racialized modernity of Western nation states and according to their representational proximity to whiteness. And now under our contemporary Asian cycle of capital accumulation, this geographic area's affective ubiquity appears much like that of the US by preoccupying and dominating global public sentiment. However, Asia as a region forces us to question if the previous measures that relied on a representational proximity to whiteness and modernity, both anchored by the earlier centers of accumul capital accumulation within Europe and the US, can continue to explain racial capital today. It is difficult to fully assess Asia's dominance as merely its proximity to or desire for whiteness. Asia's own standards for culture are not simply replacing whiteness, but ra are rather complicating the very terms that have helped us make sense of the world. For example, many Western media companies continue to primarily cast white entertainers with a few Asian Americans and other people of color involved but these media companies actively shape their narratives and appeal, um, and, and appeal for the Chinese market, even though production still primarily happens in the West. The Chinese renminbi as such saturates and meshes with representational demands. Unlike the symbolic and representational force of the US through Disneyfication and the predominance of white norms, Asia's ubiquity does not fully arise through equivalent representational racial politics. Instead, I would argue it affectively shapes how things operate under capital. Thus, how do we talk about race in light of this notion of affective or distributed ubiquity that is related to, yet unique from representational notions of race? Admittedly, whiteness as a symbolic representation has not disappeared or simply come to be displaced. Rather, whiteness intertwines with Asian ubiquity, whereby Asia becomes less the new standard, but more entangled with whiteness within contemporary racial capital. This talk, however, highlights Asia's ubiquity in order to emphasize the need to grapple with the complexities and complications its ubiquity brings. The emergence of Asia as ubiquitous is thus emblematic of Asia becoming central to the globe rather than simply the West's particular oriental other. Asia's affective intensity and spread, its ubiquity, emerges across sites like China, South Korea, and Japan, amongst others. How do we discuss this particular moment considering these non-Western nations have been historically understood as behind within a racialized model of capitalist modernity? In other words, our analytics to understand race and nation have shifted from one of representable, knowable victim, other toward defining and saturating capital itself. Further, Asian American studies has identified how some within this minoritarian community are coming closer to identifying with majoritarian capitalist values. Following these important queries, I turn to our earlier definitions of race and examine additional avenues to reconsider race as it is historically related to representation, victimization, and exclusion. By asking us to move away from a representable exclusion or victimization as primary measures for race, I do not ask us to simply celebrate inclusion into liberal society. Instead, I propose that we work toward defining race in relation to the structural, expanding our understanding of the phenomenological subject as always about social structuration, in order to produce a more relational and class-engaged definition for the term. Asia, when understood historically within this moment of transition, presents a challenge for, to the terms of difference for many fields. Asia is not only a place, but also a concept, helps us question if US-based critical race theory and queer of color critique are adequate to theorize how racial capital functions in the contemporary. Although this talk cannot fully answer this with empirical certainty, it highlights the import of exploring such questions and the need to reframe how we understand race and the subject in light of capital accumulation. Previous models of difference based on a representational proximity to a dominant norm, 
and form a critical frame like Orientalism that emphasizes being outside of a standard of whiteness and victimizes perpetual outsider, rationalizing warfare and capitalist extraction. And as Colleen Lai has noted, quote, Asian American cultural studies can be said to have not yet moved beyond Orientalism, that we have not found a way to exceed its critique, end quote. Although previous frames continue to provide explanatory power, they cannot fully or explicate our contemporary world with regards to Asia and China's ubiquity amidst racial capital. Earlier theorizations of race, as Lai reminds us, continue to rely on a narrative of race that emerged from the 19th century. Further, China's mediations of capitalism with socialism, with socialist past, further demands a retheorization of post-Cold War notions of race as it relates to histories of liberalism and Marxism. In other words, the post-social becomes another crucial analytic to balance. Take, for example, the influx of Chinese capital that helps fund Asian American activism against affirmative action. Although some in the community pa use past victimization to argue against what they perceive as race-based state discrimination within the realm of education, it comes at the expense of a larger coalitional politic. For those from China who have a differentiated and distant relationship to histories of American racialization, they desire and presume access to institution, particularly for those from the expanding upper class elites or those desiring such positions in post-socialist China. In turn, they help fund um, those from within the Asian American com community who imagine forms of 19th century Asian anti-Asian discrimination enduring today. However, the place of Chinese capital in this situation forces us to pause and rethink a model of race premised upon victimization. Historical victimization can only explain so much. How might we attend for class mobilizations of race that benefit the racialized petite and petty bourgeoisie? Do our current definitions and approaches to race provide enough explanatory power to fully grapple with class alongside the international primarily gendered division of labor? This talk first contends with older models of race that rely on forms of representational exclusion and then works through models of race that center affect, phenomenology, and class. I then build upon queer of color critiques attunement to form and affect with an aesthetic practice to illustrate a different model for engaging race within the Asian century. This paper ends by using fireworks to explore our definitions around race and capital. This minor object is both a material commodity that circulates and a metaphorical aesthetic that rethinks race amidst changes in capital accumulation. Fireworks themselves are not only a commodity to track Asia's ubiquity, but also an aesthetic form to imagine race in more expansive relational ways suturing the phenomenological subject to others across history and geography. This talk thus engages these dual approaches to fireworks to examine what definitions of race are needed to read capital in the Asian century. I specifically engage the fireworks of Chinese artist Sai Guochang as producing an aesthetic method to ground our approaches to history, race, and affect. So the first part. Um, previous models of race have frequently relied upon narratives of subject exclusion and victimization. These models use representational notions of race to compare how a group symbolically fails in degree of difference, form, or norm, like whiteness. In turn, many argue for inclusion and increased representation as the remedies for historic exclusion, for going a deeper, for going a deeper restructuration of institutions. From there, the larger emancipatory project comes to be premised upon the eventual disappearance of race from modern thought. Denise Ferrer de Silva in, identifies the limit of such late liberalist approaches due to what she calls, quote, the socio-historical logic of exclusion, which assumes that racial difference and the exclusionary symbolic, cultural, or ideological strategies it entails are extraneous to the modern ethical landscape. It can write the racial only as an unbecoming aid to economic class subjection, end quote. As a result of these models, the larger project of emancipation is premised to arise, quote, when the juridical and economic inclusion of the racial others and their voices finally realizes universality, end quote. In this way, De Silva astutely locates how the logic of exclusion and victimization ultimately reaffirms non-Europeans as the other and considers race as extraneous to, quote, post-enlightenment modern social moral configurations, end quote. Race, under this logic of exclusion, fundamentally operates through representation, 
within a paradigm of symbolics that measures others in their proximity to whiteness and racialized nations in their proximity to modernity. This model of race was helpful for theorizing race within the American cycle of accumulation. During the rise and establishment of the American century, the predominance of US capital across the globe and the representational symbolics of cultural norms established by white standards both became the measuring sticks for minoritarian and non-Western others. The logic of representation was helpful, uh, was a helpful way to explicate, explicate race as national and global forms post-1945 and into the lingering aftermath of Cold War racialization. More specifically, Orientalism itself is often a discourse premised upon how the other is represented and understood as distinct from the legible norms of whiteness and Western modernity. For example, historian Takashi Fujitani astutely identifies how Japan approximates whiteness through modernization. He historicizes racial logics during the early part of the 20th century and locates how Japan is able to represent itself as symbolically an almost white modern nation. So this is sort of a history in relationship to um, the American cycle of capital accumulation. This is what we might uh, call race being understood as a representational aesthetic of semblance to white modernity. Fujitani critically historicizes forms of racialization to avoid race becoming a trans-historical signifier. The need to historicize race becomes more, even more critical considering how Asian racialization amidst the Asian century problematizes narratives of victimization, exclusion, and representation. Candace Chu identifies this as, quote, the potency of model minority discourse and its sustaining political economic structures in both inducing identification with the exceptionalism that is Asian difference and affirming the unquestionable value of majoritarian US culture and politics, end quote. There are those racialized subjects that desire uh, normativity and majoritarian life, the life of global capital. And within a broader frame, there are those who seek to access a particular genre of the human, to use Sylvia Winter's words, which is that of, quote, the Western and Westernized, or conversely, global middle class, end quote. Race, in other words, when historicized within this contemporary juncture of the Asian century, can provide access to capital, yet many continue to rely on representational ideas of victimization and exclusion as the primary formulations for race. Two. Asia's ubiquity and its contemporary racialization cannot be fully understood, understood through representation. Asia is not trying to simply approximate itself to a standard or norm of white modernity. This is not to say that Asia simply defines the new norm, displacing white supremacy for some imagined Asian supremacy. Asia does not displace the old standard to become the new one. Instead, we witness its saturation and permeation that both furthers and changes old ways of functioning. Put differently, Asia's ubiquity indicates that race operates effectively alongside representation. Asian racial form reveals how race has become less about its degree of representational difference. Instead, race's porosity highlights its availability for multiple means. Its malleability can be used for various political ends. Race's affect means that it is then a site of governance. This is not per se a net positive. On the one hand, race's effectiveness and ubiquity indicate that it does not immediately enable victimization and subjugation. Instead, as indicated by Asian racial form today, it can be used towards majoritarian ends. On the other hand, race's affect enables one to relate um, race to others well beyond one's own subject position. I propose to consider race's affect not so much to dismiss historic exclusion and victimization. However, these modes of represent representable exclusion often come to be deployed toward a liberal focus on individual feeling and personal advancement. To further an understanding of race as affect toward a relational project, however, we must turn to history and the structures that maintain forms of victimization across multiple groups. These structures not only produce a racially liberal relation across forms of difference, but also highlight the material privileges and varied property interests different groups possess. In other words, I emphasize the need to account for race as affective with and through phenomenology. Below, I examine the aesthetic as providing the methods I engage uh, to engage such a reworking of race for the Asian century. Put more explicitly, Asian racialization as ubiquitous and affective is not only critical to highlight a relational and solidarity politic, but also difficult to contend with due to changes in how capital accumulation functions. 
As such, we must grapple with not only structure, history, and relations, but also difference and dispossession. Such an account relies on accurately studying and locating the phenomenological subject in its history to under understand how one victimization and privileges inform not only existence, but also relations to others. Further, in order to resist race becoming a, a, an ahistorical and transcendental signifier through affect and to further situate race relationally with class, we must historicize it within this moment of shifting accumulation within the Asian century. Um, Arigi has noted how capitalism has changed through systemic cycles of accumulation. Building off of world systems theory, Arigi noted four long centuries from the Italian city-states of the 16th century, the Dutch um, of the 17th century, and the British of the 19th century to the United States post-1945. Throughout each cycle, two shifts occur from material expansion into accumulation through finance capital. This model led Arigi to account for the waning of the US into the rise of the Asian century with China as a key site. It would be a mistake, however, to simply consider China as representationally embodying and entering a Western model of capital or becoming part of a racial capitalist order that had previously been held by its colonizers. China instead is a market economy which mediates capitalist classes and projects within a historical and existing East Asian state system that can be differentiated from their European world system. Put another way, this differentiation is critical since it allows us to understand how the Chinese state has more autonomy to operate beyond the complete interests of the capitalist class. The state itself has the choice to operate for nationalist interests that are not always bound to class interests. Postalist China and parts of Asia are not simply fitting into a representational standard of modernity. So these are kind of the first two parts of the paper where I'm kind of sort of trying to think through a different model of race, thinking through its kind of history, um, and then sort of arguing around discussions of ubiquity and what this might offer. So this is sort of the unwieldy part where I turn to fireworks, so we'll see how it goes. Um, for the remainder of this talk, I would like to return to the object I began with. Fireworks offer a model to contend with Asia's ubiquity through not only the material production and ownership of fireworks, but also its aesthetics and form. Although tracking the circulation of capitalism's objects is a helpful move, it primarily involves a symbolic and representational approach. Aesthetics and form provide additional modes in which to consider racial capital. The aesthetic as a method allows us to move beyond the routinized and at times predictable narratives when situating objects in relation to Marxism proper, commodities, fetish, ideology, and circulation. Put differently, I join and develop Queer of Color Critique's robust development of aesthetics as an essential method. I'm more interested in engaging quite literally the form and aesthetics of fireworks for what they model in relation to race, affect, phenomenology, and history. At a broader level, I'm curious about the relationship between racial capitalism and aesthetic inquiry. Can aesthetic inquiry provide a racial capitalist analysis beyond merely examples or objects of circulation or as sites of resistance. So this is sort of kind of what's, what I'm trying to figure out and think through fundamentally is um, in thinking through questions of racial capital, um, I think it's sort of easy to kind of turn to objects and say like, look at the commodity, here's how accumulation happens. You kind of track the art market in terms of how money's accumulated. Um, so that becomes one kind of model for the aesthetic. And then there's also the kind of model in which the aesthetic becomes this, the, the mode of resistance or the mode of difference. And I'm sort of interested in just what the sheer form of it might provide as a sort of different model of thinking through, um, through race and racial capital. In addition, I focus on fireworks to explore producing a lexicon that reconsiders race in the Asian century. In other words, I situate racial and aesthetic forms akin to Colleen Lai by focusing on, quote, the theoretical generativity of speaking not of identity, but of form, of trying to investigate race and nation through the relationship between aesthetic and social modalities of form, end quote. Through form and aesthetics, I hope that such a, quote, deeper historicization via closer attention to form will lead us beyond the political and cultural dimensions of Orientalism, end quote. Further, by engaging form to shift our focus beyond Orientalism, I connect racial form to histories of socialism and capitalism that are crucial in grappling with Asia's ubiquity. As Shimeshu has articulated, quote, the Cold War divided the world around a particular kind of dichotomy of East and West, socialism and capitalism, not the East and West of Orientalism and Occidentalism, end quote. 
The form of fireworks provides apertures into contending with racial capital amidst the ubiquity of Asia. Um, the last part of this talk engages the aesthetic and form of fireworks in order to offer a way to trace race through both affect and phenomenology. The form of fireworks in particular sutures the affective sublime with the subject's phenomenological experience, that of both minoritarian and majoritarian existence. In other words, the form and aesthetics of fireworks model a way to understand the subject as in relation with others and within structural and affective domains. I call this effect a comrade aesthetics. The material history of fireworks reveals a connection between the affect of the sublime and the production of nation states through warfare, gunpowder, and com commemorative displays of the birth of nations. As both Kevin Salatino and um, Simon Barrett have argued, the sublime's connotations of awe and the grandiose are achieved through every nation state's use of fireworks. During the Enlightenment in Great Britain, Edmund Burke, who inf greatly influenced Kant's theorizations of the sublime, imagined this affect as a sublime that was as a form of mortality that involved terror, with fireworks representing a mathematical sublime that was, quote, an almost ungraspably vast formless object, end quote. The sublime of fireworks, in turn, became a metaphor for war, as many, like Salentino and others, have argued. Uh, Li Hongliu uh, carefully connects the use of fireworks as ornament to represent a modern mode of control. Depictions of fireworks emerged throughout the production of clocks and other pictorial representations in China and the broader early modern world. Fireworks and others came to serve as a transnational mode of imagination, whereby the representation of fireworks provided a sense of order. Most accounts trace the emergence of this technology and its global circulation within China and the Silk Road during the 13th century. One might thus understand fireworks as aiding the production of a world system. These histories reveal how the state's affective goal for these dominant deployments of fireworks has been to overwhelm a viewer to, to a point of losing one's sense of time and space. Fireworks fuel a crisis in representation. By getting lost in the form of the sublime, a subject becomes overwhelmed and isolated from others, space, and time. But differently, the sublime of fireworks produces an individualism that forgets history, others, and totality. The formlessness of the sublime captures and scatters one's focus, so to be overwhelmed to a point of losing oneself. This is my return to Frederick Jameson. As Frederick Jameson reminded us decades ago, the postmodern, as a cultural dominant, conditioned subjects to similarly forget history with the sublime as a central aesthetic of late capital. According to Jameson, this forgetting is amplified by postmodernism due to late capital's sense of the sublime being tied to questions around representability and totality. It is the impossibility of representing totality that leads to the affect of what he identifies as a camp in a hysterical sublime. Amidst constant warfare and sensorial intensity, a camp sublime emerges as the vehicle to forget history. Sai Guochang's fireworks, however, produce other aesthetic effects beyond the totalizing affective sublime. These works deal with the problem of history by not reproducing the sublime of capital. They direct our attention toward others in relation through a kind of phenomenological method. The artist deploys fireworks akin to CNI's category of stuplimity, which is astonishment that is, quote, paradoxically united with boredom. Nye's aesthetic of stuplimity, quote, reveals the limits of our ability to comprehend a vast, vast extended form as a totality, as is Kant's mathematical sublime, yet not through an encounter with the infinite but with finite bits and scraps of material and repetition, end quote. Size fireworks deflate the affect of the sublime. Size works are not sublime, quotes drawing from Nye, since here, the initial experience of being aesthetically overwhelmed involves not terror or pain, um, eventually superseded by tranquility, but something much closer to an ordinary fatigue, end quote. Sai does not scatter our attention. The stuplimity produced through phenomenological attention enables a viewer to not become overwhelmed by the immensity of late capital, utilizing attention as the means to extend the self outwards to those past and present and across space and time. One's phenomenological field is subdued and not lost, allowing one to trace their location in space and in relation to others. Size fireworks thus force individuals to get out of themselves, not as some universalized connection. Although we are pushed to get out of ourselves, it is done with a socialist inflection, relations to histories of subjugation, and phenomenological, phenomenological guidance, rather simply a dispersed aspiration. 
For example, in black ceremony, Tsai ignites a stream of black fireworks at Qatar's Arab Museum of Modern Art. Um, so sort of play this it's very short. Um, both the visual and sonic elements muffled this as the sublime into sublimity. Visually, the work does not deploy the use, uh, the usual multicolored and exploding form of fireworks and instead ignites small black spots reminiscent of a flock of birds. Sai tempers the grandiose display of saturated colors against the night sky by igniting black flecks, ac flecks across a crisp blue sky. In addition, the sonic effects of black ceremony take us out of the body. The reverberations from this piece produce a more minimal impact when compared to public displays of fireworks during the celebration of nation states. The cascading soft booms of the ignitions in black ceremony congeal together into a sonic reverberation that almost whimpers when compared to the fireworks in the Beijing Olympics, which Sai worked on as well. This softer sonic touch does not operate as, a, as sublime distraction. Sai creates a shock of the muted boom rather than of the bombastic new. Beyond the aesthetic effects of black ceremony, the location in Qatar tethers the fireworks to a particular space and time. The Arab Muse Museum of Modern Art uses Sai's art star status to herald its own participation in a larger network of modernity. The museum frames Sai's retrospective at his, as his biggest exhibition since his 2008 Guggenheim retrospective, using the artist to situate the museum within a network of recognized art spaces. Further, the description of Sai's work places Qatar in relation to China, demonstrating the desire to figure Qatar in, into an expanding global network. These inclusionary tactics alongside the production of sublimity veer the operations of black ceremony away from simply the sublime. Fireworks are typically deployed to distract a subject and lose track of totality. The function of a weaker or deflated to sublime for size practice thus deals with a central question with regard to Marxist totality and also critical race theory and queer theory, the place of history. Tethering of subjects' phenomenological focus to space and others produces a constellation of relations in totality, forcing one to, rec one to reckon with the place of history. Marxist totality works against a liberalist tendency that often deracializes and dehistoricizes analysis. To historicize, however, cannot simply be the end. Marxism often discounts histories of religious, racialized, gendered, and sexualized economies that produce the very conditions of modernity. Thus, queer of color critique and relational analysis highlight the need to attend to minoritarian life, not to simply ameliorate multicultural urges, to revise the very norms and terms that frame our understandings of the universal. The aesthetic and form of fireworks I contend provide a method for grappling with the sublime affects of late capital, toggling across phenomenological registers from the individual to comrades and others, background to foreground, and self to structure. Size fireworks do not simply encourage us to be lost in the affective sublime. Rather, he tethers the subject via phenomenology to structure and others beyond the self. Popular art discourses often frame Sai as using gunpowder across a flat canvas or plane, the sky and ground respectively. However, his works extend well beyond a singular dimension, directing our folk, folk, uh, ph phenomenological foci beyond the sky and ground. This aesthetic effect guides one's focus without being overtly, overly didactic or completely overwhelming. By situating phenomenology alongside affect, I hope to specify how Sai uses the aesthetic to offer a method for engaging the world differently. His fireworks do not simply direct our focus outward. Rather, he sutures self to outside so as to constellate the subject beyond the formless sublime. Uh, for those familiar with this artist, many have been confused or entertained by his desire to engage with aliens. If you read his work, this is one of the, whenever I engage his work, this is the part that confounds me and I think many other people. So this is my attempt at trying to sort of think through like why aliens. Um, if we read his work as simply directing us to the unknown extraterrestrial universe, we miss the opportunity to think more broadly about the aesthetic effects of his work. Sai does not simply rethink the human and shift us to another non-human subject. Instead, he turns towards the sky to direct us to what lies behind us. The body and its representation are obliterated in his focus on space, particularly in this piece, Sky Ladder. In this work, he produces a literal ladder to the sky, removing our focus from the world to what is above. 
He diverts our attention away from the drama of the everyday and ourselves towards what exists beyond. Rather than reproducing the sublime, he encourages us to ponder what lingers apart from our immediate world. Sai's continual invocation, invocation of the extraterrestrial could be understood as simply a turn towards the posthuman. Since 1989, Sai has described his fire and gunpowder works as attempts to communicate with aliens. His project for extraterrestrials, um, number one, at the Tama River, grounded this focus. In 2012, at, Los at the Los, An at Los Angeles Geffen Museum, many of Sai's works used images of aliens and UFOs. Rather than debating the veracity of alien life, I take this focus on aliens as a way to further define what constitutes us differently and apart from imagined other being forcing us to define a sense of humanity beyond our current order. Sai deploys the metaphysical, what is beyond the human, to contend with how we have defined and can define the human beyond racialist or national societies or even intellectual tendencies. I situate Sai's aesthetics and with phenomenology to contend with lingering questions that haunt discourses surrounding affect. Both representation-based and affect-based approaches have distanced themselves from phenomenology, as its analytics are often understood to be centered around an ableist reliance on visuality, presumptions of a holistic sense of perception, the universalization of a subject and experience, and an over-reliance on intention. Further, accounts from European intellectual history have further revealed that the recent shift towards affect, with the increased reliance on Spinoza and Deleuze, historically emerged as a move away from phenomenology. However, phenomenology provides the theoretical tools to grapple with an affective turn that has often deracialized discourse akin to the sublime, detached from histories of race. So I have another section here that I sort of took out, but I'm trying to further define my use of phenomenology, particularly through Merleau-Ponty and Frantz Fanon. Um, so uh, in sort of in brief, I rely on their development of phenomenology as a method to suit yourself to histories, others, and structure. But I took that out. Uh, for today. Size so aesthetics operate as a method that direct us to these multiple registers for the subject, affect, phenomenology, and history. Rather than simply reproducing the hysterical sublime of Lake Capital, the use of fireworks in these works provide mechanisms by which to theorize race apart from individualist liberal models that have primarily centered representable legible experience. In this way, Size works land where Jameson leaves us in his essay on postmodernism cognitive mapping. However, although most have explored Jameson's cognitive map in, mapping in relationship to affect, I've turned to phenomenology because it provides the means to account for contingency and difference, contingencies that are necessary to understand Asia's ubiquity. In other words, I rely on phenomenology as a way to mediate the ubiquity of Asia and capital alongside China's post-socialist condition. Further, the use of phenomenology and affect with regards to socialism and Marxism are unwieldy with regards to orthodox Marxism. They are promiscuous, or in the words of Jack Derrida, they are spectral. To produce such an orientation to Marxism is necessary, particularly during this historical juncture, considering China's post-socialist condition and negotiations with capital, so these contingencies. How might a spectral, irreverent relation to Marxism help us think through racialization in the Asian century? To deflate our relationship to Marxism provides the opportunity to retain its ethics and projects without reifying some of the larger problems that have been identified with orthodox Marxism. The project of racial capitalism has sought to situate race as central to the emergence of capital, but what happens when not just the fungibility of the categories of the human and value align with capital, but where previously fungible Asiatic form comes to be the driver of late capital itself? Derrida's Offsided Spectres of Marx, the, state, the full title being The State of Debt, The Work of Mourning, and The New International, historicizes the post-social within a global frame. The spectral involves um, a, quote, question of repetition. A specter is always a revenant. One cannot control its comings and goings because it begins by coming back. Think as well of Macbeth and remember the specter of Caesar. After exp having expired, he returns, end quote. Written in 1993 for a conference grappling with the perceived withering of Marxism following the Berlin Wall and the liberalization of Chinese markets, Spectres of Marx offers a framework by which to deal with the relational politics of socialism across the globe. Derrida grapples with the presumed dominance of Western democracy, uh, uh, working against uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama's declaration of the end of history. Derrida critiques such declarations by examining the texture of the spectral especially as it helps us theorize lingering relations to Marxism. 
I bring to the fore Derrida's spectrality as it relates to the post-social in order to examine what Derrida names in the last part of his title as a new international. This relational notion works um, beyond the sovereignty of states and deploys international justice to, quote, be inspired by at least one of the spirits of Marx or of Marxism and ally themselves in a new concrete and real way, even if this alliance no longer takes the form of a party or of a workers international, end quote. The spectral quality of a relational international that is guided and inflected by Marxism emerges from phenomenology, whereby, quote, the phenomenal form of the world appears itself as spectral, and the phenomenological ego, me, you, and so forth, is a specter, from Derrida. For Derrida, phenomenology becomes the key means by which to understand the spectral and a relational international, one that deploys the spectral to toggle with and beyond Marxism and to grapple with the fascist authoritarian legacies of communism. Derrida's phenomenology of the spectral indicates a relation to past socialisms that remains open and relational, yet guided by Marxist ethic. The spectral becomes an ethical orientation that does not hold onto an identification as dogmatically socialist, Marxist, or communist. Phenomenology becomes not only the method that sutures past with present and future, but also a giant, gently guiding ethic informed by socialist past. Ultimately, how we orient ourselves phenomenologically as spectral to the past and others produces both a sense of self along with the sense of the world. The phenomenology of the spectral enables relations to others that form this new international. The new international and a spectral relation to Marx allow us to grapple with shifting notions of race and the global in light of Asia's ubiquity. In this way, the racialized subject might be better understood beyond an individual representable victim towards a comrade with others across space and time. Comrade in Mandarin Chinese, Tongzhi, refers to not only the term, but also is a slang for queer subjects. This notion of the comrade allows us to understand the subject not as defined through a universalized liberal individualism. Rather, it is a subject that invokes minoritized histories and relations. The comrade allows us to conceptualize the subject as always in relation to others. These relations are both in solidarity and in antipathy. In this way, a comrade aesthetics allows us to phenomenologically track self to others across and within difference, meaning that we can begin to create a model that grapples with race beyond represental forms of exclusion and victimization. Size so fireworks direct us to a comrade aesthetics which sutures the phenom phenomenological subject to others in space and time. Through such connections, however, a Marxist ethic guides this relational project. Drawing from Derrida's phenomenology of the spectral as both rooted yet departing from the nation state, a comrade aesthetics produces a transnational relationship, relationality that operates beyond discourses of the state. Um, this articulation of post-socialism through spectrality directs us instead towards an understanding of the production of the modern world. Derrida contends that the phenomenal, world, the, phenom the phenomenal form of the world itself is spectral in order to highlight the conditions that frame our understandings of the global. Through spectral, and sort of similar to uh, Denise Ferrer de Silva's work, through spectral phenomenology and a comrade aesthetics, we become, le we become less concerned with identifying the, um, the sort of correct uh, party as Marxist or not, and more with the dominant logics of modern thought. The point of a spectral phenomenology and comrade aesthetics, then, um, is to reorient how we approach the world and one another. As a way to conclude and to further illustrate Sai's aesthetic method, I want to end with a conversation published in 2018 between the artist Sai Guochang and the philosopher critic Boris, Boris Groys. The two discuss Sai's use of fireworks and gunpowder. Um, while doing so, they swim around the post-socialist post -socialist conditions that plague China and Russia. Groys locates the issue of history and memory central to grappling with this condition. Quote, it's precisely the structure of memory. At certain levels, people remember, are ready to cry, but at some other level, they forget." End quote. In this way, a comrade aesthetics and special Marxism are meant to contend more centrally with the place of history. And what is most important here is that the vehicle for this is through the aesthetic, where Sai evokes a fairly Kantian idea. Quote, he says, to me, part of art's power resides in its non-practicality. These days, we are so utilitarian that we can't see the power of things that are useless, end quote. 
So the aesthetic of fireworks, Sai produces a method that theorizes the subject of history as always in relation to others as comrades. In doing so, his comrade aesthetics do not presume a simple solidarity. Instead, these aesthetics theorize relations through the violence of difference, using Asia's ubiquity as the opportunity to re-examine race and capital beyond the confines of representation. That is it. Thank you so much, Han Tai, for that talk. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, while we give the audience maybe a little time to, oh, can I? Yes. <laughs> oh, no, please. Yes. <laughs> no, no, it's really good. Um, thank you. That was super fascinating. Um, I wanted to talk about the peasant, um, and I'm thinking about the peasant da Vinci's. The so part. the peasant. Da Vinci's. Okay. Do you know this project where mm -hmm. Saab brought the farmers who, oh, yeah, 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 who yeah. made yes, 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 flying yeah, yeah. devices so they could meet the aliens, mm -hmm. right? Um, so Saab is a curator. There's a very awkward display with a bunch of white first worlders called around a circle. The peasants turn on their flying machines, which sputter and make smoke and, right, little tiny fireworks. Um, and for me, this figure really usefully both illustrates and complicates <laughs> your project here. Uh, because to me, the photographs of Sai's work have a sublime aesthetic. They're aerial, they're distant, they're beautiful. Uh, even the jokey ones where the atomic mushroom happens over double negative are like you know, really far away, so the heroic Michael Heitzer is now the heroic side. So I, I dispute a little bit hmm? your claim they're not sublime, because I think the sublimity is reproduced in mm -hmm. the reproduction of the representation of these. Yeah, yeah. And, okay? and I think that's a helpful way to think about the kind of medial, the kind of the live performance as opposed to kind of the photographic yeah. reproductions. So I kind of want the peasant in here because I, I want to know more about your decoding of race as it becomes ethnos, as it becomes class within China, mm -hmm. right? So the migrant worker, the one without papers, the South mm -hmm. Pearl River Delta, you know, type that is, you know, problematic in Beijing. You know, the whole Han thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, okay, this is a hot button issue right now, but what do we do with race within whatever China is? Socialist, mm -hmm. no longer Marxist. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the peasant da Vinci's are part of Sa's amazingness because he just like wants to perform the awkwardness mm -hmm. of like this ethnos that we are not going to be able to understand because we're in Venice, you know, on an art tour, right? So anyway, that's that's maybe a mess of a question, but I kind of want you to bring the ethnos into this so that class can be figured as an internal racial project of a, of a Chinese hegemon, mm -hmm. of a yeah. Han hegemon. And, and Sai knows all about that, I presume. Oh, of course. And that's part mm -hmm. of what's being performed in that project. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Sorry if that's no, 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 too no, many. I, I, I appreciate that, bringing attention to that work, because I'm also thinking about um, you know, 1999, his work, um, the, the rent collection courtyard that won, you know, that really kind of put him on the map. And so if you, in some ways, that the piece that you're citing, if you pair that with, um, with Rent Collection Courtyard together, it really does bring out some of the themes that you're kind of pointing to around the figure of um, socialist past, the, pe the peasant, um, and questions of labor that I think all of them sort of bring together kind of the earlier point that you're also bringing around around um, the, the, the specific media that requires a different kind of um, attention to the sublime, right? So I, I could definitely see that helping nuance the argument there. But I think the kind of larger question that you're pointing to, which is something I've actually been struggling with and thinking through this, is, um, is, is the question of 
like because I think the first two parts I'm just sort of saying like look we need a diff we need to think of race in these in a different way from how it's historically been defined particularly through Orientalism, and I've been struggling kind of with, um, and perhaps there's really no answer, but with this sort of what I'm kind of proposing here. Um, in this paper, but I've also been trying to figure out about how scholars within Asia um, are, have been defining race, particularly through some of these questions. And it's, it's, I have no answer to it. it this is, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it's exactly where I'm trying to sort of place pressure on and figure out. Because um, on one hand, I don't, I'm, I'm always weary of getting sort of reproducing race within a nationalist discourse. And so that's kind of the part where I am a little hesitant about it, but I definitely see the need in which to think through that, particularly because of the history of socialism and, and, and sort of, and workers, the figure of the worker. Um, so I, all this to say is like, I'm thinking, a lot, I have no clear answer right now, but I definitely think that that's something, as you're flagging it, that's exactly something that I've also been struggling with and thinking through some of the work. But, um, but I, I, in thinking through the kind of, the, the peasant da Vinci, and then there's some, there's much there that can be thought through vis-a-vis -vis this work as well. So I can definitely, that's a helpful suggestion. Yeah. Uh, if anyone else has questions, you can either go up to the mic or I can just pass it. There's, uh, uh, in the meantime, I have a question. Um, yeah. I was kind of hoping you could situate this work um, <laughs> with some of your previous writings, especially Minor China, because um, I think you're dealing with a lot of similar issues that you bring up in the book, especially around representation and affect, um, and also thinking about like a broader transnational, transcultural framework. Um, and then also I was thinking about certain phrases you were using in the talk, especially the idea of saturating capital and um, the minor object. Um, so I think it would be helpful for people who haven't read all of your work before, um, to just sort of understand where this is coming from. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so it's funny, I feel like I've purposely been trying to forget what I wrote, and <laughs> I don't even want to think about what I wrote anymore from before. But um, so Minor China is a sort of book that came out last year that is um, kind of putting to, go to what I'm calling like the miners method. And so the kind of goal of it is to think through the problematic, and that is often about when we talk about contemporary Chinese art, which I'm sort of using as a way to think more broadly about minoritarian and non-Western art, the narrative is always, you know, the artist is resisting the state, right? That's kind of the easy narrative. And the one thing I'm really interested in thinking about is taking affect, object orientology, new materialism, sort of what I'm doing, all these minor turns, as methods in which to sort of think through the work. And it's not so much about we need to also account for affect and feeling in the work, but it's rather about thinking about, about the use value, the use of the of the minor, of these minor methods as ways to actually as a method to actually point to the ontological conditions and epistemological assumptions that inform work, that of, that inform discourse. So that's really kind of the big the turn that I'm using vis-a-vis -vis the minor. So I think you can see some resonances there. Um, and a big question that I take on in the book then is how that helps us think through social structuration as a sort of aesthetic. Um, I think here what I've been really trying to do is just sort of think more broad. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I think I, this is sort of like a, um, <laughs> it's like a side piece work. Like I, I'm sort of like, I am, my next book is really thinking a lot more about disability in China and the U.S. because in 1990 both the ADA, the Americans for Disabilities Act is passed in the U.S. and in 1990 China passes um, its major um, state-based uh, nation-based disability legislation. So it's like why the height of neoliberalism in 1990 does disability come to sort of articulate our understanding of the world. So that's kind of like the next big book that I'm like, I'm, I'm exhausted and thinking about, but it, I'm excited by. So this I'm sort of seeing as just kind of like a smaller piece that I'm sort of thinking through. Um, but I think what, rather than sort of repeating kind of let's turn to the minor, I'm really just interested in really thinking about the discourse of racial capital and um, and the place of the aesthetic there. Because um, part of it is related to minor China in the sense that I want, I want to sort of th rethink the routinized ways that the aesthetic is often used as the, as the narrative of resistance. 
Um, but here, I think, I think I'm sort of placing that in relationship to racial capital discourse mm -hmm. um, and really trying to think more thoroughly about what the aesthetic can actually offer as a kind of methodology as opposed to just illustrating objects in circulation or becoming the, the resistance model um, for against capital or, um, or whatnot. So I've been really thinking a lot about the kind of what form can do for thinking through some of these questions. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I was wondering if you could just clarify or maybe elaborate on how you're um, using or sort of theorizing Orientalism in this context. You know, you sort of talked about Orientalism towards the beginning of your talk, um, and then later with that work that you showed um, in Qatar, um, then introduced. Occidentalism as well, and this kind of, you know, coming together of Orientalism and Occidentalism, you know, Arab world and China. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could, yeah, expand on that and on how you're using those theorizations. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm drawing a lot from Asian American literary feminists of people like Colleen Lai and others, and for them, many. I think for her and for some others, they're trying to sort of think about Orientalism as the dominant frame that informs um, informs much of um, much of much of Asian American studies as a field. And so, in the use of there's clearly Said is sort of in the sort of definitions of them. But I think Said has a like you know if you read through it, it's quite complicated and. Um, I've been thinking about this work and this piece and Said in particular and, and when he talks about Freud and the other, like there's a lot of work that I'm interested in sort of thinking through it that can nuance some of this. Um, but I think when I'm using it as a kind of shorthand, it's really thinking about um, drawing from Colleen Lai and others that are really trying to think about its sort of overdetermination and defining like the Asian as, as um, sort of the history of inscrutability, the Asian as other, um, to sort of reproduce these the, that kind of relationship. So that's kind of the particular history I'm, in, I'm interested in thinking about and the use of Orientalism for that. Yeah. And then so one and two, go ahead. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I mean, this might be like a redundant or simple question, but um, I mean, I've, like I imagine like all of us have seen fair share of fireworks in my life and I remember as a undergrad exchange student in Germany there was some big fireworks championship over like the Herrenhäuser Garten in, in Hanover and they, the, the students told me there that every year China wins and then I remember also with the Beijing Olympics how people were taught it was the greatest fireworks show and so on. So my question is, with the kind of staggering numbers that you, like the, your first sentence, this, that to me is sublime, the staggering number of capital and, and fireworks that are being transferred only to the US and I imagine to other places as well. I'm actually curious about what kind of role, both aesthetically but financially, fireworks play for China, whether, because it seems, and again, this is mostly from like popular, accounts and ignorance on my part that fireworks have kind of appears like a national symbol or and like national import and so on. So I'm wondering uh, culturally, historically, what do fireworks kind of play in Chinese imaginary? Yeah, I mean, so, if, and so this is part of the research that I was doing that I sort of took out some of it, but Li Hong Liu and others that I've been kind of interested in, in seeing some of the historicization of fireworks in China and its circulation and its relationship to the Silk Road. So there's a lot of kind of some of that history um, in that imagination. Um, but I think with something like the Beijing Olympics, um, you know, Sai Chang worked on those. And I think this gets to your point around like, you know, it, he's not categorically not sublime, right? So I think I take that point and I think you're correct there. And, I, and if, if we think about the state apparatus vis-a-vis -vis the Beijing Olympics and then his, his sort of use of the sublime in those, in that context, um, the, it, it, it sort of, it definitely, it furthers the kind of national imaginary and use of fireworks, right? I just, I can't, you know, 
20, 2008 is now, what, 14 years ago. So it feels so just so recent, but I just remember like the footprints of fireworks. I don't know if people remember that. It was just so shocking to me, just like, wow, he's creating like these footprints of steps in the sky. It was just so sublime in that sort of way. Um, so I, there's definitely a kind of reading that one could easily do vis-a-vis -vis the Beijing Olympics and the role of fireworks there vis-a-vis -vis the sublime and his sort of, um, his, his relationship to them. But, um, but yeah, but that's definitely part of um, sort of when I'm, I have, you know, I've written, I've shortened this for this talk, but part of kind of summarizing and thinking through the, the use of fireworks within China and the globe, but that's sort of part of that history there. I have a, a naive question about something I don't understand and would like to understand better, and in case it's related, but the, the, in listening to the talk, I was struck by this um, uh, f phenomenon of, uh, not in the high art sense, but in how in uh, uh, Chinese, uh, certain Chinese cities, particularly along the Silk Road, I've seen and, and uh, uh, a very strange relationship between like reconstructed enormous physical monuments that have a kind of historical sublime and completely space age, you know, laser, uh, uh, sol and lumiere shows that aren't quite fireworks at all, but, but actually because they happen, you know, every single night, multiple times a day, but that they, that they reproduce certain kinds of narratives of, of, uh, uh often of, you know, uh, 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 to kind of knitting together or figuring or telling certain historic s stories about those places and their, their uh, you know, usually about their long history as part of, <laughs> of China, et cetera. So, I, I, don't, I mean, you, you must have seen this phenomenon, been aware of it, or, and, and I, I, I'm super interested whether and how you think it might be related in, in this history, particularly in light of the questions that uh, Caroline was asking as well. Yeah. Um. My mind's going to Krakauer for some bizarre yeah. reason, so this, I'm probably just, I should probably just stop myself at this point. But um, I mean, I'm just thinking about so the, far, the you know I'm tr I'm trying to thread a space to then like delineate a space to actually think about fireworks and aesthetics, and I think one could easily talk about the nation like just go full throttle with the nation state and talking about fireworks, and I I'm resistant to that because I, I'm, I, 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 I do think that even in specific works by Sai Guichang, that there's a kind of play with, with, sublime, with the sublime that does some really critical work for us. I think the other, the reason Krakauer comes in is just thinking about just a longer genealogy of mass spectacle and um, mass media that can be easily situated within there, right? And part of that, can be, you know, a kind of one could easily do the kind of Frankfurt readings, Frankfurt School reading of um, of mass media enjoyment, and then connect that to, you know, theories of revolution and like quelling quelling the people, making them happy. So there, like, with when I when I'm like looking at fireworks, there's this there's this unwieldiness that I'm always trying to do. For it's I'm not trying to do that, and I'm not trying to do that, but trying to focus here, which I think can just you know get anyone in trouble, um, as as I always like getting in trouble. And so there's I, so I think that is definitely an avenue. I think I'm less focused on that precisely because of the kind of argumentation that I'm trying to build, which isn't to say I can't think about it together, but I could easily see one developing that through. I mean, I love Krakauer, so just going to Krakauer in that sort of way. But that definitely is a, a phenomenon sort of worth noting vis-a-vis -vis the use of spectacle more generally in, in mass movements. Yeah. I have sort of an unformed question. Um, but uh, I was wondering how you were thinking about like the fear of ubiquity of Asia and Asian capital um, historically in relation to all this. So like if you're thinking about visual representations like the, 18th cent uh, the 19th century cartoons of the Chinese laborer um, being the embodiment of like monop the monopoly um, being really prevalent, especially like in the last two years, I feel. Uh, and I'm also thinking of like Laura Hyun Kang's work on um, Asian capital as a sort of like deformed or like aberrant form of capital as well, or and also the star 
capitalist people if you want to go back to the like embodiment of capital in the Asian body. Um, so I was thinking, I was curious, like, how is this difference in this discourse you're talking about, especially with the rise of China now, um, and language around that, and also um, how do we move beyond just decrying that as forms of racism and uh, staying within the realm of like representational politics? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so one of the things, um, I mean, it, essentially one can boil down this paper to think about like what happened from these 19th century cartoon images to crazy rich Asians. I mean, that's basically the, the gist of this paper. And I, like, I really like minimizing my argument, but, um, but it's to sort of illustrate the fundamental difficulty of, of where and how representation sort of is situated because it's not just simply like Asians are now being um, properly represented, right? Or, but rather, the field, it's rather to really think about what conditions certain fields. And I think when, I think to Maggie's question, when we're thinking about Orientalism, it, the use of it and its invocation informs a field and its tendencies to constantly rely on inscrutability and that 19th century definition of it in those images. So I guess one way to sort of think about like, I mean, this is one example that I, I, I have in the paper, but I, I took out for shortening, but also because it involves a lot of explain, explaining, is that I've been thinking much about um, stop Asian hate, right, that's been happening, and that in talking about stop Asian hate, I think, I think it's easy for us to go into discourses of representation, which is to say this is drawing from a history of inscrutability. It's a violence of seeing Asian bodies as easily as fungible and attackable and weak, right? And one thing I've been thinking a lot about in terms of Asian hate is that, you know, this it in thinking that there is part of that because part of the representational politics of it is that it's primarily women and older women, right? I, I f fear for my mom's life. Like that's not okay, right? That is a real feeling I have that's informed by representational history. However, I'm also interested in how that intersects and overlaps with a contemporary discourse on Asian capital, meaning in the cycle of accumulation in the Asian century, there's such a shift in which property interests are quickly leaving the US center of capital. And how much do the Asian, Asian bodies are both it, part of that representational history, but also part of Asia's ubiquity. And those sort of fears and anxieties around the decline of the American empire and US capital are actually in, deeply enmeshed together. So in some ways, this like that's, that's kind of operating behind all of this is, is really kind of through that question that there's the 19th century history that bring, bridges into today. And so from like these cartoons to crazy rich Asians, but I feel like it's so, it's actually really emblematic of um, how can we actually talk about it that isn't just only relying on the representational narrative because then it's about the positive representations, the humanizing turn of it, as opposed to understanding within a larger racial capitalist order and how so many Western anxieties about the decline of the West, right, and the rise of Asia is deeply embedded to some of this violence. And that's something that I'm, I'm trying to kind of write and think through a model in which to think through that. Um, because many, many of these, many of these older Asian women and Asian women in general, they're being more, you know, attacked, and some Asian men. That m much of this is part of that history, but I think much of it is also about a kind of larger social anxiety. So that's that's, that's just to kind of ground it. That's kind of the, sort of the images that I'm kind of grappling with to think about how we can actually talk about the contemporary in certain ways that don't just turn to representation and then positive representations and then liberal na narratives of carcerality, right? So that's kind of part of what's swimming in this in that way. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Um, so if there are no other questions, um, then on behalf of the Department of Architecture, the communications team, and the HTC Forum, I'd like to thank Hentai for his talk. Uh, it's been great to have this 
forum um, to hear about Hentai's really interesting work and to be able to engage in discussions on these questions of race and racial capital and the aesthetic. Um, and then I'd like to turn it over to Nicholas DiMaggio, head of the Department of Architecture, to conclude the spring 2022 lecture series. Um, so, uh, before we close, uh, I'd also like to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Hinti Yap, for the amazing talk, um, uh, which I think I'll be sitting with for quite some time. It was really, um, really wonderful. And for the History Theory and Criticism Forum Executive Committee for their hard work in putting together tonight's lecture, and of course, the Department of Communi Communication team, especially HTC's own graduate, Aidan Flynn, who's been with us all year, um, uh, helping in this uh, uh, work and making it all happen for our spring public lecture series. So this is the end of this series. So uh, 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 we have retrospectively had the pleasure of continuing um, uh, after a, hi a COVID hiatus, our in-person tradition of events here at MIT, uh, and through a hybrid model um, that came out of the pandemic, inviting those from around the world to engage as well. This spring, we've confronted thermal dynamics in architecture, performance, globalism, and racialization, power systems and the climatic turn, the mythology of architectural authorship, and the complex relationship between building, place, and people, amongst other matters. Um, through it all, we've sought architecture's role in helping us understand the world and our responsibilities and possibilities in transforming it. We're particularly grateful to all the diversity of our department in. Uh, and its discipline groups for collaborating in production of this series. Um, we've had the uh, privilege as a result of ho hosting not just architects, but also designers, urbanists, urbanists, historians, critics, theorists, artists, social entrepreneurs, and experts in computation and engineering, just to name a few. Alongside these academic programs and public events, we've hosted two amazing exhibits in the Keller Gallery, the Architects Collaborative, 1945 to 1995, and Thresholds 50 before after. The latter will be on view through May 18th. Through and despite COVID, we've continued to host all of these events and publications and create our lecture series. Um, uh, and that has uh, involved just such an enormous amount of effort on behalf of those here in the room, uh, our amazing team at MIT AV and everyone else. So thank you to you all. And thanks particularly to our viewers around the globe, uh, as well as in this room who make it all possible as well. We'll welcome you all back in the fall of 2022. I wish you all a wonderful, restful, productive, and peaceful summer. Thank you so much. Thank you.